uh, directly to Muslims. However, we are aware of the fact that what Allah has revealed for Muslims is also for the whole world, if the world will accept it. Uh, <clears throat> the topic we have chosen is that the management of uh, spiritual and material concerns. By putting these two concerns together, uh, a lot is to, is to be gotten. Uh, the big problem for most of us is that we separate these two concerns. And uh, we think that uh, the spiritual concern is left for the preacher and the material concern is left for us. Uh, when <clears throat> when the, both these concerns burden everybody equally, everybody is brought to his uh, success or to his doom because of the mismanagement of these two concerns the spiritual concern and the material concern. I'm not speaking of spiritual concern in the sense that it is commonly understood. I'm not talking about uh, religious rituals, uh, spiritual values, religious rituals and things like that. I'm talking about <clears throat> the, 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 the tendency in us to favor certain things and not to favor certain things. Um, for example, uh, some of us <clears throat> have a tendency to favor uh, good times, and good times in our uh, 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 mind is uh, going to a dance and a party and listening to music and dancing and having good good time on the weekend. To us, that's good time, and many of us just live just for that. To go out on the weekend and party and and dance, and that's for us. That's good time. The tendency in you is spiritual. The tendency toward that, the tendency in you is spiritual, and that's what I mean by spiritual, spiritual concern. <clears throat> um, we don't have this, this uh, idea in our religion of spiritual life separate from material life. For, for Muslims, the life is whole. It's one life. The life is whole. I have a physical body, but uh, I don't function just as a physical body. I also have mind in here that's abstract, and I have a spirit in this body. And all these things work together. The whole works for me has to be told in terms of all three. In terms of my physical body, my mind, and my spirit. Now, <clears throat> most of us uh, are trying to use our minds, but our spirit getting in our way, and uh, that's what I'm. That's what i That's the main thing that I hope uh, to uh, bring to your attention today, is the need for us to manage our spirit. People who people who try to manage their spirit develop powerful muscles. Powerful muscles. The the, the best muscles for survival in the world, not these. And I'm pretty good with this too, especially when I was young. I was pretty good. Um, <clears throat> not these muscles. The best muscles for survival in the world are the spiritual muscles. The spiritual muscles. But not in that, not in that uh, strict uh, religious sense that most of us think of spiritual. Again, I'm talking about the tendency to be pulled in one direction and in another direction. If you can discipline yourself so that you don't allow influences to take you to the things that you know will bring you down, then you'll be successful in life. But if you can't discipline yourself in that way, you are sure to fail. Now, um, uh, uh, we go and look at uh, what Allah has revealed to us in the Quran about the person, the self. And Allah, God says, of the success and failure, he will certainly be successful who invests in his soul, who spends on his soul, his own soul. And here his soul is talking about that same concept that I'm trying to bring to you, the concept of the person as a person pulled by influences and tendencies. Uh, uh, and the one who fails to do that, God says, is certainly to fail. 
The one who neglects to invest in his own soul is certain to fail. For sure he will be a failure. Uh, we, could, we could just close with that. You could go home with that. And it would be enough. That's it. That's all of it. I told her, man, my, 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 my associate in, the, in this uh, work, I told him, I said, well, I know they're expecting a big deal. I said, well, it will be a big deal, but it's so simple, I can do it in two minutes. <laughs> if we will accept that. However, we know that Allah has not left us uh, with that alone. He has given us the guidance. The guidance, Al Huda. And Allah Most High says in the Quran, ذلك الكتاب This is the book. Speaking of the revealed Quran, the last revelation. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه This is the book. And it is no defect, no mistakes, no doubt. لا ريب فيه Hudan lil muttaqeen Guidance for the upright. Guidance for the regardful. The God-fearing is translated in many, many different ways. It means guidance for the people of conscience. Guidance for the people of conscience. And for Muslims, conscience begins with God. We must first be conscious of Allah. Taqullah. Be conscious of Allah. Be regardful of Allah. And it goes on to things uh, Im Im important, uh, other things in, in their importance, according to their importance. Uh, it includes even uh, regard for uh, our family relations. Our family relations. It says, what are harm? Well, are harm? And the family ties are the family relations. We are to taqi la, also, well, are harm? And also the family relations. The family relations. Many mistakes have been made in translation into English by people intelligent, well-meaning, good Muslim scholars, but who, did not, who didn't have the command of English, especially for American people. So they have given good translations, but those translations need improvement now. Um, uh, and uh, that's why sometimes we take one term and we have to explain it and, uh, in, in several ways before we can see it as we should see it. <clears throat> The, 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 the management of material and spiritual concerns is only possible for us, we, we might think we are being successful, is only possible for us if we have something directing us, a deciding authority in our life, uh, the, an authority in our life that decides everything else. The only successful ones will be those who, ha who acknowledge an authority in, our, in their lives above everything else. If, you, if you're not acknowledging any authority in your life above everything else, you're going to be a failure. Even, even, the, man, even the man who looks, or the woman, who looks at their, at their life and, and, in a very practical sense and, 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 and almost as, um, uh, oblivion, unconscious of uh, what should be uh, the authority of God in their life or anything. They're not thinking about religion or church or mosque or synagogue or anything like that. All they're thinking about is being successful in their life, being successful as, a, as an employee, being success, successful as a business person, as a career person. They're just thinking about being successful. If they don't have an overriding authority in their life, they're not going to be successful. Now understand this. Allah in our religion does not close the door of material things and benefits to people because they don't acknowledge Him. Allah says in our holy book, the doors to those things are open to all. You can make money. Allah is not going to say, oh, did he, did he take the, the, the shahada? Is he a follower of Muhammad, my last prophet? Well, I'm not going to let him get rich. No, he said the doors of those things are open to all. But my special blessing is only for my devotees. So he has a blessing that's better than all that. And, and, and you can't get that without being devoted to him sincerely. Uh, what, what does it mean in simple, in just simple words? It means 
you can have the material world, whether you respect God or not. You can have much of that. Uh, but uh, you will never be really happy. You will never be satisfied. You will never be pleased. Uh, if you want to be at peace and satisfied and feel good about yourself, uh, you have to put Allah, you have to put your creator before the world. You have to value the goal of having satisfied your creator more than you value your ambitions in the world. See, that's the, that's the simple answer to that. <clears throat> However, we have to understand too that for Muslims, we are not bothered with the problem of seeing material requirements in our life as something by nature in opposition or against the real human life. In other words, no matter how saintly we become in this religion, we should never take on spiritualism in that sense. We should never take on spiritualism to the degree that we begin to fear material involvement. Material involvement. Uh, 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 work in the material field <clears throat> should never be a threat to us or to the life that we choose for ourselves. The answer is simply to serve Allah, the God of both the spiritual and the, and the material. And he requires of us in, this, in our life as Muslims, he requires of us that we progress spiritually and in every other way. Spiritually and in every other way. No matter how good I am spirit, spiritually, no matter how good I am morally, no matter how good I am intellectually, if I have no material progress in my life, that's a sin on me. Say, so well, how is that, Brother Imam? Allah says, Wabtadi, Fima Atak Allah Akhira. Seek with what He has made uh, available to you. With, with, by what he has made available to you, your intelligence, your muscle, your strength, everything you got to make progress. Seek with all of that the hereafter. Now let us, let us, let us uh, slow down right here. Look, God tells me to seek the end, the paradise, with everything that he has made available to me. That means even to gain the promise of the hereafter, or to be in good shape with God in the hereafter, I have to use my moral nature, my moral force, my, my, my spiritual force, my intellect, my intellect, <clears throat> my, my, my physical force, everything in my possession. I should be marshalling everything in my resources uh, to, to, to make progress toward the hereafter. So uh, uh, a person work in our religion working for the hereafter he wants to, to make a good showing in school. He wants to make a good showing in education. He wants to make a good showing in science. He wants to make a good showing in, 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 in physics, whatever. He wants to make a good showing in, in business. <clears throat> he wants to make a good showing in culture. He wants to make a good showing in everything that he's involved in, everything that, that he's attracted to. He wants to make a good showing there because God has told him to make good use of whatever I have made available to you for the hereafter. Make good use of it for the hereafter. Our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, we know that he said, <clears throat> live today as though today is going to be the end of you. That means, don't say, oh, I have tomorrow, I have next year. I'll take care of it then. Don't put off, the, off uh, for tomorrow what you can do today. That's another way of saying what he said. And then he also said, <clears throat> live as though you're never going to die. So now, if I know I got many years in the future to go, I should have some long distance plans. Yes. So this is, uh, this is the way the prophet has ta taught us. And uh, we know that um, he has warned us against the 
pitfalls of material appetite and we have to keep a balance. We are not to let our material appetites hurt our moral nature or any other aspect of our nature. And we are not to let our spiritual life <clears throat> deny us uh, progress in the material world or in any other avenue of life. We are not hermits. We don't withdraw from the world no matter how holy we want to be. We never withdraw from the world and leave the world to those who want business and we take to the hills and levitate somewhere. We don't do that. Our religion, our religion is a, is a complete religion. Our way of life is a complete way of life. <clears throat> it's called a comprehensive religion. Comprehensive religion. Requiring that we devote attention to all important matters for the human, natural human being. We are saved from extremism. We are saved from extreme of materialism. We will be saved from the extremes of spiritualism. We will be saved from that. Because Allah for us, <coughs> for, Allah, for Allah for us is a God that asks of us obedience to Him and, but he also asks that we fulfill all obligations. That we fulfill our obligation to our parents. We fulfill our obligation to our families. We fulfill our obligation to those who have assisted us, to those whom, to, to whom we are indebted. We fulfill our, fulfill, fulfill our obligations to society, to society. And it begins with your neighbor next door. So if we accept Allah, knowing what Allah has asked of us, if we accept to obey Allah, to come under His authority, how can we go into these extremes? Our religion is so plain. Our religion is so plain and so complete in its instruction to us that we will never go into these extremes. You find any Muslims going into the extreme of becoming materialistic, they have stopped worshiping Allah as Allah is to be worshipped in Quran. And as Prophet Muhammad demonstrated to us, they have left that. They have left the idea of their religion. They have left the motivation that should be in all Muslims. And that motivation is, first of all, to recognize the authority, overriding authority in your life, that is Allah, your creator, and follow the guidance, the book, the Quran, as lived and demonstrated to us, to the Muslims, by the Prophet that he chose to give that revelation to, for all the world, Muhammad, the peace and the blessings be on him. It is very simple. If we're having trouble in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, or Detroit, or anywhere else, if we're having trouble succeeding with our life, it's because we are not established in that life. First, we have to be established in that life. To be established in the Muslim life, you have to do more than just hear what it is to be a Muslim. You have to make a decision to be a Muslim. And to be a Muslim is not just coming here and praying with us or praying together and saying assalamu alaikum wa alaikum as -salam. That's not, the, 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 that, that, that's small. Being a Muslim is obeying Allah. Being a Muslim is being conscious of the, of the requirement on, on, your, on you, the requirement in your life to obey Allah. Right. Not just to read the Quran, you have to obey Allah. Right. You have to feel bad when you miss your prayer. Amen. You have to feel hurt inside when you miss your prayer. If you can go on missing your prayers, you don't feel no hurt, it doesn't bother you, you will never be successful as a Muslim. Right. But if it bothers you that you have to miss your prayer today, or that you miss your prayer at Maghrib, or you missed your prayer at Fajr time, at dawn time in the morning before the sun comes up, if it bothers you, then you have the religious spirit of the Muslim. If it bothers you that you are not eating halal meat, you're eating animals that are not killed properly, or you're eating things that may be contaminated for a Muslim, with the pork or pork essence or something. If it bothers you that you have to be in a situation like that, then you're in, you're, you're in a good situation spiritually for the Muslim life. But if that doesn't bother you, we don't expect for you to be successful as a Muslim. 
And believe me, many of us haven't got acquainted yet with the teachings of the Quran, the blast revealed book from Allah, the Lord Creator. We haven't got acquainted with it enough yet. We haven't got acquainted with the life of the Prophet enough yet, peace be upon him, to really understand the seriousness of these things that Allah has asked of Muslims. That you don't take intoxicants. That means whether it's in a liquid form or drug form or substance or material, drug, what they call dope, whatever form it's in. If it takes your senses away, you're not to take it. It's a great sin. And it's a sin of the works of Satan himself. I mean, I'm in the shaitan, the, the Quran says. From the works of the Satan himself. So you are not to do that. It's a very serious matter. You are not to lie. If, Muslim, if you call yourself Muslim and you go on in, in, in the habit of lying doesn't bother you, yeah. all of us will lie occasionally. <laughs> but some of us got a conscience. <laughs> If you have no conscience, forget about it. You're not going to be successful as a Muslim. We have to acknowledge Allah as the, as the uppermost authority in our life. The deciding authority in our life. See, we need an authority to manage other authorities. And if there's no deciding authority in our life, management is poor or not to be found. Don't you know the people that have the greatest difficulty managing life in the world, in the modern world, is the African American people? All of the people that I know, according to my knowledge of it, I'm going by what I know, and I think I'm pretty well up on it, <laughs> the people with the greatest problem managing their life in the world is the African American. Now why? We're not stupid. We are bright, we are brilliant people, we are very intelligent people. So how come we have this big failure, this big ugly, ugly thing? It's because we do not accept an overriding authority in our lives. And I hate to criticize Christianity, but Christianity is the most risk risky religion I know of. It has its superior points, but it's the most risky religion I know of. It leads the average person to face too many risks, too many dangerous risks. You can't succeed without rational guidance in your life. You can't be successful with people that have intelligence and people that respect re the power of reason, with people that think logically and plan on the basis of what is sound logic. You can't be successful in competition with those people, trusting that the Spirit is going to save you and deliver you, and you don't have to do nothing but just say, I believe in Christ. You ain't going to make it with that. If people could make it with that, the African American would be in control. <laughs> well. We begin by stressing the way we are to look at our life if we are to be successful. That is, look at the life as one corporate whole. Everything works together and everything should be working together. When things are working separate in you, you have problems. If your mind is in one kind of discipline, going after one thing and your moral life is in another one or your spiritual life is in another, you're in trouble. We need something that address the whole of our life and give direction to the whole of our life and brings the whole of our life under authority one. One authority. That accounts for success. You may say, well, how come you Muslims ain't doing doing so well. And the Muslim may say, well, brother, how come those Muslims in Africa ain't doing so well? I've told you already, 
we've, we've, gotten out, we've gotten out of contact. We've lost contact with what we should be following. We are not in touch with what we should, what we should be following. We are not in touch with the guidance. <clears throat> Those who are in touch with it are successful. If they're in touch with it, they stay with it, they, they're, they're, they're bound to be successful. They have to be successful. No other way. And Allah says that, doesn't he? He says, and the believers must triumph. He says the believers must triumph. That means that this is guaranteed. If you are sincere and faithful and true to what he, to what he asks of you, he says you must triumph. And we have a history of those who are faithful to what Allah asks of them. And we have a history of triumphant people, very successful people. People who are now uh, being looked at again after centuries of darkness being over the, over, over the picture. They're being looked at again. And you may have saw on public television or some other, some other uh, uh, channel or uh, uh, some other network, you might have seen them telling uh, the American people of how the American civilization is indebted to the first followers and the community of the Prophet, peace and the blessings be on him. They're studious uh, uh, scholars, uh, they're science, research people, they're scientists, how they uh, brought about a reawakening of uh, the mind and intellect of the, of the, of the, of the uh, scholars and uh, guided them uh, toward the revival of the sciences and the revival of civilization. You're hearing that now, not from Muslims only, but you're hearing that now from the Western people themselves. I've seen some very, very excellent programs on television. No one even told me about it. I just happened to be there and the television was there and the channel was there on the right channel and uh, excellent program where, where the truth was being told about the excellence of Muslims and what they contribute to uh, bring about the renaissance, the reawakening of civilization and uh, intelligent pursuits in the Western world and made possible what we have here now. Uh, advances in civilization, uh, appreciation for moral and ethical life. I read myself a book, book in uh, part of a book by a writer, a Western writer, uh, where he said that, uh, and he documented these things, that the Crusades, where, is, uh, where, where it has to be seen as an ugly thing, but uh, a lot of good came out of it because he said that those wars brought Christians and Muslims in direct contact with each other. And he said that when the Christian Christians saw soldiers, saw that the Muslim soldiers could fight the war very effectively and still take a bath and shave regularly, they decided to do the same. <laughs> I'm not making jokes to anybody, I'm just telling you what he said. See? And um, really I don't I don't look down on, on uh, European people for that. You, if you, when you see where the European people came from, and uh, uh, even in, in, in uh, uh, medieval times, what, uh, if we know where they came from, ancient times, what the, what they, how they lived in ancient times, before civilization, before even the Greek knowledge uh, dawned on this planet, when we study their, their, their life, their superstitious life. Oh, they were in, they were really in, you know, the North can scare you more than the South. Yeah, the environment of the North is more scary than the environment of the South. Can you imagine being up there hearing all those spooky winds up there and all that ice and snow and, and huge, huge hills of nothing but ice and snow, big white hills of death. You know, cold is death. And all of those mountains of death standing all around and it gets so dark up there. Sometimes they experience in some parts of the north, they experience six months of darkness. That's where the expression midnight sun come from. It'd be dark in the day, in the daytime part, me, then they experience six months of day. It'd be, it'd be nighttime, but they still can see the sun. Now, you know, people that live like that in that environment like that for, 
for hundreds and thousands of years, you know, it can be spooked up some terror. <laughs> and I read about the spirituality of the Germans and certain other uh, European people before enlightenment came to them, how spooky and how superstitious they were. And uh, they were given to uh, uh, savagery, savagery, their superstition, um, just uh, allowed them to be savage and, and, and uh, uh, the, some of the horrible things that they would do, just like animals. They can trace their own history back to a state where they were just like crazy, enraged animals. Even the idea of God was, a, was, a, was, was, was an intoxication that, that, that uh, fed violence and insanity in them. Their God was a mad thing. The idea of God was a mad creature, you know. Yeah, for many of them. Now, I'm not saying that other parts of the world didn't experience the same thing, but I think um, the North is more spooky than the South. That's what I'm saying. The North is more spooky than the South. See, the South shows uh, organic development, right? Yeah, you go to the South, you got organic development there. And that organic and development just it communicates with the intellect. And, uh, and, and if you don't believe this has some bearing, if you who want to study, you scholars, you, you pretenders, <laughs> scholars already know, right? you pretenders, you guys who want to play scholars, uh, go and study it for yourself. Just study the past history, ancient history, and before, the, before they got enlightenment and civilization, see what they were believing in, see what their behavior was, study the environment there, and you'll come to the same conclusion. If you're intelligent, you'll come to the same conclusion. And they didn't make progress until they met with people outside of that environment. Yeah, they didn't met, study their history. They didn't meet, they didn't make any progress until they met with people outside of that environment. And uh, the, 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 the more they came south, the more they liked it. Now you find them all over the south. <laughs> all over the South. That's not the natural home for the European man, not for the strict Caucasian man. That's not the natural home for him. His home is not the tropics. He likes it there. And now it is his home because, by choice, now it is his home. But the pure European stock, that, that so-called pure white man, he came from the North. If the environment colors you like, it's, like, like it is. Your white, white environment, snow, ice, white environment, white man. You see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got the dough, you don't put it in the oven, white dough. <laughs> you take the biscuit, put it in the oven of Africa, black dough. <laughs> yeah. Someone called me up on the radio, that's why I have to talk like this. <laughs> And they, they, they say some things that make me feel so hurt and embarrassed. <laughs> uh, I was talking on the telephone to the radio station here, and when one sister said something, I did this in the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pull myself back up and lean on the desk and try to keep talking, you know, without them knowing that I had suffered a setback. <laughs> yeah. I said, boy, oh boy. Rabbi Elijah Muhammad made so much progress. And here they took him back to the most primitive days of his leadership. I like to follow the line of progress. That's intelligent. Follow the line of progress. Don't go back to where the man in kindergarten. Don't go back to his kindergarten days and then project it. You put that little six-year-old boy up there. That's my leader, Elijah, when he was six years old. That's my man. No, I want Elijah when he was grown up and yeah. felt good about his achievements and was talking tough yeah. and had the courage to tell you to shape up. Yeah. Even get rid of a lot of your false pride and conceit. Yeah, but, he, but he, that, that's a real leader. A leader that will tell his people to put down what you've, been, what you've been had years ago. Put that down. Time is out for it. That's a sincere, sincere leader. That's a strong leader, too. It takes a strong leader to tell you to put down something that he was once telling you to pick up. As they say, wise men change, and you know the rest of it. <laughs> the biggest 
challenge for the human being is to manage his life spiritually. Spiritually, not materially. You think, oh, the, oh, the greatest threat is the material things on us. No, 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 no. Uh, the greatest threat is uh, to you is spiritual. Because that's working against you and, and it's too powerful for you. Spiritual influence, influences are too powerful for us. We cannot manage spiritual influences without Allah. No, you have to have Allah. These things, he's given us a body. This own body will defeat me if I'm not careful. You see some people, they become so vain, so much in love with their own body, the physical body, that the body sends them to the shrink, the psychologist. Some, the bodies, the love of the body sends them to the grave. And you hear them dying with that disease where they want to stay so thin and they love their beautiful thin self and get that disease, few of them have died with it. What they call anorexia or something like that? Yeah, they get it and die because they're just so obsessed with that body. Looking good. <laughs> well, our religion saves us by protecting for us that relationship upon which all other relationships depend. That shows the role of the individual, the great role of the individual in this religion. We are not to look at people and say because he doesn't have wealth or because he's not a scholar or because he's not in position of authority, we don't have to listen to him. No, his authority is that he knows what God said. That's his authority. He knows what Allah said. He knows what the prophet, that's his authority. Yes. So praise be to Allah. Um, I, I return now to uh, the religion itself, that is the religion of Al-Islam, that is a comprehensive religion, it is a religion that addresses the total life and the total needs of man and does not uh, uh, bring about a dichotomy or separation in the life of man where one side is working against the other or threatening the other. We know that anytime we give, extreme, give ourselves to extremism, that's going to be a threat. If we give ourselves to extremism in spiritual, spiritual life, that's a threat. We give ourselves to ex extremism in material life, it's a threat. In our religion, all extremism is bad. Allah says God against extremes. And again, Allah says the devil invites you to extremes. So we can't close this address without mentioning the big danger that is presented to us by in the Satan himself, the devil. We know that when Allah created everything, he created it perfectly suitable to the best condition and the best opportunities for the human being. He made it the best. Uh, we call it paradise, right? He created paradise uh, for us. And um, we know as Muslims, what the prophet has told us, that uh, it was Satan who changed it. He changed it from paradise to uh, a very perilous creation for man. He put enticement and um, uh, what you call things to lure you, lure you from what Allah wants. He put enticements, attractions to lure us from what Allah wants. So he made, made the, the world very unsuitable and very dangerous for the servants, obedient servants of God. The Satan did this. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should see these things in their nature as being bad. No, they're not in their nature as being bad. They're, they're bad only in our misconception of those things. We misconceive them. We misconceive the things. We misconceive the purpose for these things. And there, there lies the danger for us. But um, everything, even the pig. The pig is an animal. God says, don't eat the pig. So we can't raise pig for somebody else to eat. That's it. No pig. Uh, uh, so, uh, but look, even that pig, Allah created him. He's of Allah's creation. You leave him alone, he's a good pig. 
<laughs> yeah, he's only a bad pig when you start eating him off your plate. <laughs> or selling him to somebody else for consumption. He's a good pig, just leave him alone. He's a good pig. Now, I know that's difficult for some of you. Because we must make that pig more important than Allah. Boy, a lot of us, we, we forget about Allah, but you mention that pig, you get our mind back. No, oh, man, I never touched any pork. How in the world could he eat pork? We never say, how in the world could he stop believing in Allah? No, how in the world could he eat pork, man? After knowing all the trichinas and trichinosis and the germs and that worm, that naked worm, man. I done heard him talk like that, you know. I don't, I don't see how that brother could go eat pork. I could do anything, man, but I don't think I could ever eat any pork. <laughs> That's changed now, though. That was, when we, that was when we had a strong desire for moral strength in our life. But the atmosphere has changed now, you know. Just loose morals. So with loose morals, that same brother, now he's saying, oh man, they ain't gonna kill you to eat a little piece of it. <laughs> Dear Muslims, I'm sure that all of us are aware of the burden on us as a people. No matter how, successfully, how successful we are individually, I'm sure all of us are aware of the burden on us as a people. We waste our resources we fear to invest wisely. We are inclined to gamble more so than to use our intelligence and, and good logic and, and plan a successful business or something. We give our money to a risk situation that's pure risk. We rather gamble than to invest wisely. I pray Allah that the Muslims will accept the Muslim responsibility to work for the life hereafter and also work for the life here and now. And don't be afraid to invest. We're not going to always be successful. If we believe in Allah, then if we see an investment that is proper for Muslims, and uh, it looks like a good investment to us, according to our own intelligence. We've studied it. We are not afraid. We know nothing is guaranteed. If we fail there, we will try again. And try, try again, as the expression goes. Yes, we never give up. Don't be foolish. Make calculated moves up with knowledge. Get knowledge before you move. And uh, 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 be sure, be sure that you've done all the uh, uh, preliminary work, that you researched the matter, you studied the matter, have you looked into it, and go on and have the courage to invest. Look, success belongs to the people who have courage to invest. You invest nothing, you get nothing. Isn't that common sense? Isn't that what we've been told? You put nothing in, you get nothing out. Some of us can't even be farmers anymore. We fret the seed won't come up. <laughs> when our fathers and mothers, they had faith at least that the seed would come up. <laughs> yeah, and they plant and expected a harvest and worked for a harvest. We have to be the same today. Put something, invest something in the world to get something out of the world. And if you're not in a position to invest, then work at getting yourself into a position to make an investment. You know when Allah tells us over and over again in the Quran to spend, 
You know most of the time what that means? Invest. Invest in the world of today for the good future tomorrow. But do it loving him and trying to obey him. Do it in obedience to Allah. And he assures us that we will be successful. Look at the money that comes through our hands. Those who study our financial situation as a people, they are saying that the, we are spending as a race or as a group in America much more than all the other groups, groups are spending. No other group that we know of is spending like we are. We are great consumers, great spenders. We are spending great wealth. So you know what we are doing? We are giving business opportunity to other people. That's all we're doing. We're just giving business opportunity to other people. We are making other people rich. It's going out just buying. We're scared. We're scared to put the put to, to put the dollar into the uh, economy. We're fit, spread to put the dollar into the financial workings of society. So we just oh, oh I'll I'll buy that car. That's new. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, give me, give me that coat. Give me two or three of those. You got to spend that money because you don't even trust the bank with it. <laughs> so, so everybody getting rich and we staying poor. I remember a time I was talking once on the need for us to invest and try to establish ourselves by that. And one brother said, well, brother, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, we ain't supposed to give ourselves to materialism. I said, Lord, how much? I corrected it, though. <laughs> I went back and got the evidence from Quran and the life of the prophet. Sure. The, a lot of us think the prophet was a poor man. Do you know our prophet, peace be upon him, was no poor man? Right. Even before he was missioned as a prophet, he was a businessman. <laughs> businessman. Working in the employment of Lady Khadija. Yes. May God be pleased with her. Working in her employment. And he was such an asset that she put him over her business because he was so successful at what he did. She put him over her business. So our prophet, even before he became a prophet, he was a businessman. So you, should, you should think about that. Say, oh, the prophet didn't have any money. He slept on a little thin man. Yeah, you sleep on one too. I would like to see us sleeping on a little thin, thin mattress where you can feel a little small pepper if you, under it, you know, if you, if you turn over on it, you see a little small pepper, pepper is up under this mattress. Yeah, that's the kind of mattress he slept on, you know, so thin that if a little small pebble was under it, he could feel it pressing his skin, you know, pressing against his skin. But I like, I like for you to sleep like that too, if you like, you know, yeah, that's very good. But uh, when you wake up, let me see you uh, ask, what is the financial situation of the good believers? <laughs> Say, come, we want to improve you, want to improve it. Here, you take this, go invest that. Invest this. Help the community. Prophet Muhammad had so much wealth, he just passed it out to bright and industrious and good-minded people. and just pass, Give them just a lot of it. Say, go and invest it. Help them the make money. Help them invest, invest. Increase the wealth of the Muslims. Yes, and that's what, I, that's what I like to do. I just got to follow my prophet all the way. <laughs> yes, I, one day I see myself, I see myself sitting there, uh, and I uh, uh, tell them to open up vault number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, say so how many, how many, uh, uh, how, how many of those, uh, uh, Mercedes dealerships I got now. Oh, no, thank you very much. Uh, tell them, tell them I want to buy one of the one of the new electric uh, the, uh, trains that they got out. And I want to want to train. I want to have my own my own train. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to see that day. You know. Say, well, how many employees we got in that bank? You see, oh, two hundred. Well, we need, to, we, got, we got more money here in the bank that's just laying up here and we don't, have, look, we don't have any good investment opportunity right now except to invest in employment. 
and build another bank that size and just so we have more employees. Ah, you see how righteous money can be? 